Welcome to another social distancing story time. This is another one we're doing outside. Today we're coming to you live and in person from the bench in the front driveway. Ooh, ah. There may even be as much excitement as an Instacart order coming during the reading. Stay tuned to find out. I'm gonna start today with, this is a fun book, um, New York in Four Seasons by Michael Storings, who's the author of A Very New York Christmas. We don't have that book, but we loved this book. We got this book when Stasha was, I don't know, maybe two. Hey, there she is, the woman herself, Stasha Rose McGee. Uh, we got this when Stasha was about two, I think. Uh, and we were still living in New York City, so we could read about all sorts of cool New York-y things. So uh, it more teaches you about fun stuff that happens in New York than tells a big overarching story, but it's got cool pictures and we like it, so we thought we would share it with you today. You finishing up your uh, fish sticks? All right. Whoops, here we go. New York in Four Seasons. So this is the calendar. You've got fall, Labor Day weekend, village Halloween parade, Thanksgiving day parade, and then winter, you've got Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's Eve, Chinese New Year, into spring that starts with Saint, the St. Saint Patrick's Day parade. And Stasha always used to talk about how mommy used to get to go to the St. Patrick's Day parade, and mommy worked a lot on St. Patrick's Day when I used to work for Guinness. And then... Because Guinness is the way to go when you're on the St. Patrick's Day party. That's right. But and I mean, then in I spring, don't know if that's true. So you I don't just, know if that's true, because little kids don't drink beer, right? Right. I, it's only on, like, an ad engine's car. Oh, I see. Um... Spring also has opening day of baseball season and Memorial Day. And then in summer, you've got the Museum Mile Festival, the Mermaid Parade, and the 4th of July. So let's learn about all these things, shall we? A foreword by no less than Kristen Chenoweth of Broadway TV and movie fame. She's one of the ones singing in Defying Gravity. She's Glenda the Good Witch. Okay, so fall, September, October, November. Here's a quote from Nora Ephron. Don't you love New York in the fall? It makes me want to buy school supplies. I would send you a bouquet of newly sharpened pencils if I knew your name and address. My favorite are gel pens. I love like the sparkly gel pens. I used to use them to underline in my books when I was in school, and I liked to write in fun colors. Those were my favorite school supplies. I love a stationery store. All right, so Labor Day weekend. Labor Day weekend in and around the city is a heady celebration of the last days of summer when New Yorkers enjoy one last sandy beach day or rooftop cocktail bid farewell to summer cottages and prepare for the adrenaline rush of re-entry to work and school. Picnickers flock to Central Park, Riverside Park, Prospect Park, and the city's 1,700, 1,700 other parks to milk the last hours of summer's leisurely pace. The weekend reaches a crescendo with the colorful costumes and street dancing of the West Indian Day Parade on Brooklyn's Eastern Parkway. Cool. Oh, the Chili Pepper Festival. Each October, purveyors of exotic and fiery chilies, a selection of fine chocolatiers, a wide variety of artisanal food makers, and an array of red-hot bands turn the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens into a food and music lover's paradise. That looks pretty nice, doesn't it? And then this is the Feast of San Gennaro. Dedicated to the patron saint of Naples, the Feast of San Gennaro was first held in Little Italy in 1926. Today, food stands, processions, music performances, rides, and arcade games bring a carnivalesque atmosphere and more than a million visitors to the neighborhood's narrow streets for 11 days in September. We used to love carnivals in New York. A lot of street festivals. One World Trade and Lower Manhattan. Lower Manhattan has undergone multiple transformations during its 400-year-old history. 
It's the lower part of the city, the lower part of the island. Um, you have, it's where daddy used to work. From Dutch colonial outpost to bustling port city to financial center of the world to the site of the World Trade Center in the attacks of September 11th, 2001. Today, this unique swath of the city is a vibrant hub of culture and commerce, all the more so in autumn when Wall Street revs up after the summer vacations and thousands gather at the National September 11th Memorial and Museum for tributes marking the anniversary of 9-11. The memorial's twin reflecting pools and serene tree-shaded plaza border the One World Trade Center skyscraper rising at the northwest corner of the very tall building, rising at the northwest corner of the former Twin Towers site. Each September 11th, two beacons of light symbolizing the fallen towers are projected from ground zero into the sky, a moving remembrance visible for miles around. On Octo in October, autumn leaves on hundreds of oak trees surrounding the reflecting pools turn the plaza into a brilliant canvas of deep golds, reds, and pinks. The Indian summer days of early autumn reflect lower Manhattan and New York Harbor at its best. Sunlight sparkling on the water, the Statue of Liberty in clear views, ferries chugging to and from Ellis Island and the Staten Island Ferry Terminal, and municipal workers scurrying past public sculptures on their way to the city. Uh, the area's monuments are many, including the old U.S. Custom House, now the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Woolworth Building. On a typical warm day, hold on, tourists and stockbrokers, attorneys and school children might be enjoying an alfresco lunch in Battery Park. And what does alfresco mean? I don't know. It means outside. This is an alfresco story time. Uh, or a lunchtime concert in historic Trinity Church at the head of Wall Street. What's up, dude? This page is my favorite page. Oh. Because I like to see happy faces and sad faces. Yeah, the drama masks. Yeah. Broadway and opera season openings. September signals the start of the season when New York's opera and theater companies debut new productions and elegant red carpet opening galas are a must for the city's social set and power brokers. Opening night as a social tradition began in the 19th century among New York's Knickerbockers. The blue blood Knickerbockers? Well, it means the blue blood families, kind of the, the fanciest people in the city, the most wealthy people in the city, who founded the first Metropolitan Opera House in 1883 at Broadway and 39th Street. These days, the Monday night opening galas at Lincoln Center begin with a parade of opera stars and celebrities arriving at dusk in black tie and shimmering gowns. On Broadway, one beloved behind-the-scenes opening night ritual is the gypsy robe. Each time a new... This is the gypsy robe. Well, I'll tell you about it. Each time a new musical opens, a decorated dressing gown is presented to the chorus member with the most Broadway credits. In the quiet theater, before the audience arrives, the cast forms a circle on the stage and the robe is bestowed on the lucky cast member, the gypsy. What is gypsy? Each the person who has the most credits, who's been in the most plays. Each new gypsy adds his or her own theater memorabilia to the robe. And when the robe is full, it's retired and they start a new one. So it has all sorts of cool stuff from all different plays all over it. And that's kind of what it looks like down on Broadway and in Times Square. Ooh, a party. You used to, you went to see the Very Hungry Caterpillar play over there. Yeah, I went to see the Hungry Hungry Palette. Caterpillar, Caterpillar yeah. when Eve was a little teeny, tiny, 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 weeny baby. That's true. All right, with, here's a quote. With my, um, with my nanny, Avi, and someone else. Mm -hmm. Some of your little friends. Okay, this is a quote from Sarah Jessica Parker as Carrie Bradshaw, the role she played on Sex and the City. She said, New York is definitely haunted. Old lovers, ex-boyfriends, anyone you have unresolved issues with, you are bound to run into again and again until you resolve them. That Carrie Bradshaw was wise. What? That's a joke. All right, the Village Halloween Parade. America's largest night parade gets underway each October 31st in the heart of Greenwich Village, when thousands of costumed revelers, street performers, and giant puppets promenade up 6th Ave in the Village I, I Halloween Parade. I'm gonna do 
The pageant has been called the largest street party in the world, drawing more than 50,000 participants and 2 million spectators to an annual ritual that celebrates the city's diversity and creative energy. A highlight of the event is more than 50 elaborate articulated puppets. That means they can bend their limbs and move. Uh, skeletons and fantastical creatures floating above the crowd. A fixture of the parade since its founding in 1974 by puppeteer and mask maker Ralph Lee. A 10-foot spider puppet traditionally appears to bless the event by crawling up and down the tower of the gothic-style Jefferson Market Library at the corner of 10th Street. Wait, Anyone in costume is welcome why? to join the parade. Wait, is it real? No, it's not real. It's a puppet. But how does it, like, climb the tower? It has little um, strings and things and sticks that can make it look like it's moving. Anyone in costume is welcome to join the parade and in keeping with the village's tradition of tolerance, you'll see not only witches and ghouls, but also plenty of celebrity satirists, fairy tale cross-dressers and brilliant body paint worthy of an artist's studio. In addition to Are more than- Are real bats? No. Than 50 bands and plenty of dancing, the parade was named a true cultural treasure by mayoral proclamation in 1994 and remains a safe and beloved annual event. Look at that parade. That's a big parade. That looks pretty fun to me. Hey, look. Why does that girl? Have, why does that statue of Liberty have red eyes? Uh, I think it's Spooky Liberty. The U.S. Open. This used to be by us in Queens. The United States Open Tennis Championship, held annually in late August and early September, is an exciting harbinger of autumn in New York. The world's best tennis players and fans from across the globe converge at the USTA Billie Jean King National Tennis Center in Queens for two weeks in the fourth and final Grand Slam event of the year. Um, she must be famous. You think so? That girl, because she kind of looks like the Statue of Liberty. She looks kind of like the Statue of Liberty, that's true. I think she is. Okay. I think she's dressed up like her. No, I think she actually is a re... I think... She, but I mean, I don't think... You she think is. she's the inspiration for the Statue of Liberty? Yeah. What mm. does that mean? The person that they based the statue on? Yeah. Mm. First held in 1943 exclusively for the fashion press, Fashion Week in New York is now among the city's largest and certainly most glamorous media events. Twice each year, more than 80 international designers showcase their collections to 100,000 industry insiders, celebrities, hangers-on, and the fashion obsessed from around the world. The New York City Marathon. This used to go right by where we lived, right, Sta? We used to go and watch it every year. We used to go up to Vernon Boulevard. It was just kind of around the halfway point. New York City Marathon, from its beginnings in 1970, when 127 people ran the first city marathon in Central Park, only 55 finished. The New York City Marathon Why has grown... Why only 55? It's pretty hard to run that far. Um, each year on the first Sunday in November, nearly 50,000 runners gather in the pre-dawn hours on Staten Island for the start of the 26.2 mile race, which winds through all five boroughs and across five city bridges before ending amid cheering crowds in Central Park. Whoever finishes wins. That's correct, whoever finishes first. Blessing of the animals. Early autumn brings the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi and the Blessing of the Animals at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, St. Bart's, and Catholic churches throughout the city. Visitors bring cats, dogs, tortoises, camels, and all manner of creatures to be blessed by a member of the clergy in the name of St. Francis, a lover and champion of animals and nature. Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is the first of the High Holy Days, the most important days of the Jewish calendar. Observant Jews blow the shofar, or ram's horn, in celebration and eat foods such as apples and honey to symbolize the sweetness of the New Year. Many Jewish people in New York can be found near one of the rivers where they recite prayers and perform the ritual of Tashlik and the throwing of pieces of bread and small stones into the water, symbolically casting away their sins. Lashana Torah for a good year. Hi, thank you. Instacart delivery has arrived. It's very exciting. Thanksgiving Eve balloon viewing. 
The first Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade was held in 1924 when animals from the Central Park Zoo were a featured attraction along with floats and musical bands. In the early days, balloons outfitted with return address labels were released into the air at the end of the parade. The lucky people who found and returned the balloons received a special gift from Macy's. That's cool, they don't do that anymore. Today, why don't they? Yeah, because they just don't do it. Too hard to keep track, I think. Today, thousands visit Central Park West and 77th Street on Thanksgiving Eve to view the hundred or so balloons being inflated. With the beautiful American Museum of Natural History in the background, you can watch as balloon technicians and their helpers go about the business of bringing Snoopy, Mickey Mouse, Kermit the Frog, SpongeBob SquarePants, Kung Fu Panda, and dozens of other characters hey. into gravity-defying three-dimensional life. Rope netting keeps the characters in place and they begin their journey downtown to 34th Street at 9 a.m. on Thanksgiving morning. Mummy and Daddy went to see them do that one time when we lived on the other side of Central Park. It was pretty cool. I did it. See, look. Check that out. Look at all those balloons. Have you ever watched it on TV? You've seen it on TV? Have you seen it on TV? Okay, I think we'll stop here and maybe we'll read about winter tomorrow. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. Okay, we finished fall. So I guess Stasha tells me next we're going to read Brave. Oh, and I may try my bad Scottish accent. We'll see, or maybe I'll spare you. Is this one of your favorite... Oh, it's all stuck together. Is this one of your favorite movies, Sta? Yeah. Yeah. Long ago, in the misty Scottish Highlands, a spirited girl named Merida entered the throne room. She was the princess of Dunbrock and lived in the castle with her triplet brothers and her parents, King Fergus and Queen Eleanor. But in her mother's eyes, Merida wasn't a proper princess. Queen Eleanor wanted her daughter to learn things a princess should know, but Merida was easily distracted. The princess was far happier in the forest on her horse, Angus, shooting arrows that always hit their target. One night, a letter arrived. At the queen's invitation, three clans were bringing suitors to compete for the right to marry the princess. Merida was horrified. I won't go through with it, she shouted. Later, Eleanor tried to explain that the marriage would keep peace among the clans. She told Merida a story of a kingdom divided among four brothers. When one selfish prince split from the others, the kingdom fell into ruin. Merida didn't care about made-up old stories. Legends are lessons, said the queen. They ring with truths. Thank you so much. Stay healthy. Soon the clans arrived. The firstborn of each clan would compete for the hand of the princess. It was Merida's duty to choose the game. I choose archery, she announced. Three contestants tried their luck. The first two missed the bullseye. Ooh, this guy's mad. But the third contestant hit it perfectly. Then a fourth contestant appeared. I am Merida, firstborn descendant of Clan Dunbrock, declared the princess, and I'll be shooting for my own hand. Thwap! Merida hit all three bullseyes, splitting the last arrow in two. Queen Eleanor was furious. Worried that Merida's actions could destroy the peace among the clans, the queen dragged her daughter inside. Merida, you are a princess, and I expect you to act like one, shouted Queen Eleanor. But Merida was angry, too. She didn't want to get married. You're a beast, Merida shouted back. I'll never be like you. Then the princess slashed the family tapestry, splitting the images of herself and her mother. Sobbing, Merida ran out of the castle and galloped away on Angus. Deep in the forest, she spotted blue lights that contained tiny figures, wisps. The princess followed the magical creatures to a small cottage. It was the cottage of a witch, Merida asked for a spell. If I could just change my mum, then my life would be better. The witch held up a ring that a prince had once swapped with her in exchange for a spell to give him the strength of ten men. He was forever changed, the witch warned Merida. That was exactly what Merida wanted. So the witch put a bit of this and a dash of that into a cauldron and made a cake. 
By the time Merida returned, her father was entertaining the clans inside the castle. In the kitchen, Merida convinced her mother to try a bite of the spell cake. Afterward, Eleanor felt dizzy, so Merida helped her mother upstairs. The princess wondered if the spell was working. The spell worked, but not the way Merida expected. Though her mother was still Eleanor inside, outside she was a giant bear. Merida had to help the queen escape because King Fergus hated bears, having lost his leg to the demon bear Mordu. With her brother's help, Merida sneaked the queen out through the kitchen. Help yourself to anything you want as a reward, she called to the triplets. The queen and the princess returned to the cottage, but the witch had left. Instead, Merida found a message. Fate be changed, look inside, mend the bond torn by pride. The princess didn't know what it meant, but the message also said that she had only until the second sunrise to change her mother back or the spell would be permanent. That night, they slept in the forest. In the morning, Merida showed the queen how to fish. For the first time in a long time, the two had fun together. Later, they spotted the wisps. The creatures led them to ancient ruins marked with the same symbol that had been on the ring the witch had shown Merida. Merida bravely entered and found a tablet of four princes on the floor of the throne room. As in the legend that her mother had told her, one prince was split from the others. Just like the tapestry, Merida whispered, remembering how she had separated herself from her mother when she slashed it. Perhaps, if she mended the tapestry, the witch's spell would be broken. Suddenly, the demon bear Mordu emerged from the darkness. This place was his home. Merida realized he was the ancient prince who had wished for strength, and the witch's spell had turned him into a bear, too. Mordu chased them. Merida and her mother just managed to escape. In order to mend the tapestry, Merida and Eleanor Bear had to sneak back into the castle. But when the clansmen saw Merida, they demanded an answer. Whom would she marry? Merida looked to her mother, who had managed to hide. Silently, Eleanor Bear motioned the words Merida should speak, They should all be free to follow their hearts, explained the brave princess, and find love in our own time, she added. The clans agreed. Now that the clans were happy, Merida and her mother slipped away to find the torn tapestry. But King Fergus found them first. He wouldn't listen to his daughter's story, and Eleanor Bear had to flee. King Fergus locked Merida in a room to protect her from the bear while he went after it. He gave the key to a servant named Maudie. Luckily, Merida had help from her brothers who had turned into bear cubs when they had eaten the rest of the spell cake left in the kitchen. They managed to startle Maudie and were able to get the key to free Merida. Her father and the clansmen chased Eleanor Bear into the forest. Merida and her brothers followed them on Angus with the cubs steering and Merida sewing the tapestry. They arrived in the clearing just in time for Merida to stop her father from striking Eleanor Bear. (gasps) Just then, the demon bear Mordu burst through the trees and lunged at Merida, but Eleanor Bear protected her daughter. A huge stone fell on Mordu, and the bear turned into a wisp. The ancient prince was finally free. Merida threw the mended tapestry over her mother, hoping to change her back. Merida realized her mother might be a bear forever. I want you back, mummy, cried the princess. I love you. As the sun started to rise, Merida looked up and saw her mother. The spell had been broken. Even the triplets had become human again. You've changed, Merida exclaimed happily. Oh, darling, we both have, answered Eleanor. It was true, though they were still different, Mother and daughter saw the strength in each other and wouldn't change a thing. Their bond was now stronger than ever. As they watched the clan sail back home, Merida smiled. As long as she was brave enough, her fate would always be something that she could decide. Oh, time for more accents. The Tale of Benjamin Bunny by Beatrix Potter. One morning, a little rabbit sat on a bank. 
He pricked his ears and listened to the trit-trot, trit-trot of a pony. A gig was coming along the road. It was driven by Mr. McGregor, and beside him sat Mrs. McGregor in her best bonnet. As soon as they had passed, little Benjamin Bunny slid down into the road and set off with a hop, skip and a jump to call upon his relations who lived in the wood at the back of Mr. McGregor's garden. That wood was full of rabbit holes and in the neatest, sandiest hole of all lived Benjamin's aunt and his cousins, Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail and Peter. Old Mrs. Rabbit was a widow. She earned her living by knitting rabbit wool mittens and muffetees. I once bought a pair at a bazaar. She also sold herbs and rosemary tea and rabbit tobacco, which is what we call lavender. Little Benjamin did not very much want to see his aunt. He came round the back of the fir tree and nearly tumbled upon the top of his cousin Peter. Peter was sitting by himself. He looked poorly and was dressed in a red cotton pocket handkerchief. Peter, said little Benjamin in a whisper, who's got your clothes? Peter replied, the scarecrow in Mr. McGregor's garden and described how he had been chased about the garden and had dropped his shoes and coat. Little Benjamin sat down beside his cousin and assured him that Mr. McGregor had gone out in a gig and that Mrs. McGregor also, and certainly for the day because she was wearing her best bonnet. Peter said he hoped that it would rain. At this point, old Mrs. Rabbit's voice was heard inside the rabbit hole calling, Cottontail, Cottontail, fetch some more chamomile. Peter said he thought he might feel better if he went for a walk. They went away hand in hand and got upon the flat top of the wall at the bottom of the wood. From here they looked down into Mr. McGregor's garden. Peter's coat and shoes were plainly to be seen upon the scarecrow, topped with an old tam o shanter of Mr. McGregor's. Little Benjamin said, It spoils people's clothes to squeeze under a gate. The proper way to get in is to climb down a pear tree. Peter fell down head first, but it was of no consequence as the bed below was newly raked and quite soft. Little Benjamin said the first thing to be done was to get back Peter's clothes in order that they might be able to use the pocket handkerchief. They took them off the scarecrow. There had been rain during the night and there was water in the shoes and the coat was somewhat shrunk. Benjamin tried on the tam shanter but it was too big for him. Then he suggested that they should fill the pocket handkerchief with onions as a little present for his aunt. Peter did not seem to be enjoying himself. He kept hearing noises. Benjamin, on the contrary, was perfectly at home and ate a lettuce leaf. He said that he was in the habit of coming to the garden with his father to get lettuces for their Sunday dinner. The name of little Benjamin's papa was old Mr. Benjamin Bunny. The lettuces certainly were very fine. Peter did not eat anything. He said he should like to go home presently. He dropped half the onions. Oh dear. Oh dear. Little Benjamin said that it was not possible to get back up the pear tree with a load of vegetables. He led the way boldly toward the other side of the garden. They went along a little walk on the planks under a sunny red brick wall. The mice sat on the doorsteps cracking cherry stones. They winked at Peter Rabbit and little Benjamin Bunny. Presently, Peter let the pocket handkerchief go again. They got amongst flower pots. Ooh. They got amongst flower pots and frames and tubs. Peter heard noises worse than ever. His eyes were as big as lollipops. He was a step or two in front of his cousin when he suddenly stopped. This is what those little rabbits saw round that corner. Little Benjamin took one look and then, in half a minute, less than no time, he hid himself in Peter and the onions underneath a large basket. Mice or bunnies do not want to mess with cats, do they? Cats can be trouble. The cat got up and stretched herself and came and sniffed at the basket. Perhaps she liked the smell of the onions. Anyway, she sat down upon the top of the basket. Uh-oh. She sat there for five hours. I cannot draw you a picture of Peter and Benjamin underneath the basket because it was quite dark and because the smell of onions was fearful. It made Peter Rabbit and little Benjamin cry. Do onions make you cry? They make me cry so bad. 
The sun got round behind the wood and it was quite late in the afternoon, but still the cat sat upon the basket. At length, there was a pitter patter, pitter patter, and some bits of mortar fell from the wall above. The cat looked up and saw old Mr. Benjamin Bunny prancing along the top of the wall of the upper terrace. He was smoking a pipe of rabbit tobacco and had a little switch in his hand. He was looking for his son. Old Mr. Bunny had no opinion whatever of cats. He took a tremendous jump off the top of the wall onto the top of the cat and cuffed it off the basket and kicked it to the greenhouse, scratching off a, fist, a handful of fur. The cat was much too surprised to scratch back. No one expects a bunny attack. When, Mr. when old Mr. Bunny had driven the cat into the greenhouse, he locked the door. Then he came back to the basket and took out his son Benjamin by the ears and whipped him with a little switch. Then he took out his nephew Peter. Then he took out the handkerchief of onions and marched out of the garden. When Mr. McGregor returned about half an hour later, he observed several things which perplexed him. That means confused him. It looked as though some person had been walking all over the garden in a pair of clogs, only the footmarks were too ridiculously little. Also, he could not understand how the cat could have managed to shut herself up inside the greenhouse, locking the door upon the outside. When Peter got home, his mother forgave him because she was so glad to see that he has fa had found his shoes and coat. Cottontail and Peter folded up the pocket handkerchief, and old Mrs. Rabbit strung up the onions and hung them from the kitchen ceiling with the bunches of herbs and the rabbit tobacco. The end. All right, one last book. Tomorrow is Waiting, written by Kylie Frank. Tonight you sleep. Tonight, as you sleep, a new day starts. Each kiss good night is a wish for tomorrow. That you'll have that you'll have wings enough to fly as high as you want. That you'll explore the world only feeling lost in your imagination that you'll search with purpose, laugh with kindness, act with friendship, and always know which risks are worth the courage they take. As you grow, I know there are ancient things that will speak to you and whisper wonder in your ear. There are first moments that will dance with you and your heart will unfold and spring. I know too that there will be injustice that will challenge you and it will surprise you how brave you can be. Take time to listen. Take time to be heard. Take time to feel small in the face of something so big. Tomorrow is waiting to be discovered, and I wonder what oceans you will keep in your heart. What mountains you will stand on, what shadows you will jump over. Your world is just beginning to deepen and grow. What do you see here? I see some jellyfish. I see a big whale, I see a squid, and some sea turtles, some orcas, some narwhals, lanternfish, jellyfish, all sorts of stuff in there. Oh, stingrays. Wow. All too soon, you'll need the map that is written on your heart. Follow it to unknown places and love will meet you there. That's it for today. Thanks for joining us for story time. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye.